Part 3. Prophethood. Lesson 21. Our need of divine leaders. The limitations of our knowledge. There are people who might perhaps ask if sending of the prophets by God is necessary to guide the people. Is our intellect not sufficient to understand the realities? Is the progress and development of science not sufficient to discover all of the secrets and illuminate all of the truths? And then whatever the prophets might tell us is one of two things which either our intellect understands well or it does not. In the first case, we do not need the prophets and as to the second, we cannot accept something which goes against our intellect and wisdom. On the other hand, is it correct for the human being to be placed completely in the hands of others and accept whatever they say without questioning? Are the prophets not human beings just like we are? How can we agree to place ourselves at the disposal of what another human being says? Answers Noting the following points, the position of the Holy Prophet in the system of the life of human beings will become clear. Number one, we should recognize the fact that our knowledge is limited and with all of the progress which humanity has made in science and technology, still that which we know in comparison to that which we do not know is like a drop in comparison to an ocean. As some of the great scientists say, all of the knowledge that we have at our disposal at the present time can only be considered to be ABCs of the great book of the world of creation. In other words, the realms, judgments, and comprehension of our intellect are a small area which has been lit by our knowledge. In truth, our intellect is like a strong spotlight, but the prophets and heavenly revelations are like a sun which shines upon the earth. Can a person say, as I have a spotlight, I no longer need the sun? Even a clearer example, life's issues can be divided into three groups, intelligent, unintelligent, and unknown. The prophets never say anything which was unintelligent, that is, something against the intellect or wisdom, and if they do, they are not prophets, rather they help us in understanding of unknown, and this is very important for us. Thus, those in the past who said that if a person has intelligence, he does not need a prophet, or like those who today say that with all of the knowledge that a human being has today, there is no need for prophets in their teachings, have not understood the realms of intelligence and knowledge of human beings, nor the mission of the prophets. This is just like a child who has studied the ABCs in the first grade and then says, I know everything and so I have no need of a teacher. Are these not baseless words? The prophets are not just teachers, either the story of their leadership is something which needs to be discussed separately, which we will do in later lessons. Number two, no one says that a human being should place themselves completely at the disposal of another person. The point is that the prophets as we will later prove, are related to divine revelation, that is, with the endless knowledge of God, and we must, by means of certain and sure reasons, know their relation to God. It is only then that the words of these heavenly message can be accepted, and we accept their reckoned teachings with all of our hearts and being. If I follow the prescription of an expert physician, have I erred? The prophets are great doctors of spirit. If I accept the lessons of a teacher which are coordinated with the intellect, have I done something wrong? The prophets are the great teachers of humanity. More important than this is that we carefully study the reason for the necessity of God sending the prophet to us. There are three reasons why we need the guidance of the prophets from God. Number one, the need of teachings. If we write upon a fantastic and fairy tale, like horse which is built of rays of light and in every second we travel 300,000 kilometers in the shoreless space doubtlessly we will need to have thousands of lifetimes of Noah just to see a small part of this extensive universe. It is clear that this universe with its greatness was not created uselessly and as we learned in our study of God the creation of this world has no benefit to God's state because he is a being who is totally and absolutely free from any need. 
who is eternal and he has no deficiency which he could want to meet by the creation of the world and humanity. Thus, we can conclude that his goal was to give mercy to others and to help creatures reach perfection, just like the fact that the sun shines upon us without it having any need of us. This light and heat of the sun is only to our advantage and benefit because what do we do for the sun? On the other hand, is our intelligence and knowledge sufficient for us to move along towards the way of perfection and the reaching towards becoming a perfect human being? What amount of secrets of the world do we know? What is the truth of life? When was this world created? No one knows the answer to these questions. How long will it remain? Again, no one knows the answer to this. Every scholar of humanity has an opinion from the social and economic point of view. For instance, one group recommends capitalism, and another group socialism or communism, and another group neither accepts this nor that and considers both to be harmful. In other issues of life, as well, there are differences of opinions among the scholars. A human being falls into a state of wonder as to which one all of these to accept. It is here that, in all fairness, we must admit that in order to reach the main goal of creation, that is perfection and nourishment of the human being in all areas, we need a series of teachings which are correct and empty of any error, ones which rely upon the realities of life, teachings which can help us upon this long road to reach the main goal. This can only be done through God's knowledge, that is, divine revelation through the prophets, because of this, God, who created us to take this journey, must place the knowledge at our disposal. Number two, the need for leadership in the social and moral areas. We know that within our being, in addition to knowledge and wisdom, other motives called instincts also exist. The instinct of self-love the instinct of anger and harshness, the instinct of lust and multiple other instincts. Without doubt, if we do not control our instincts and they dominate over us, even our knowledge and intellect will be imprisoned, and the human being, like the oppressors of history, will be changed into wolves which are far more dangerous than the wolf of the wilderness. We need a teacher to learn ethics. We need a model so that we can learn from him according to the principle whereby one narrates something and others follow. A perfect and disciplined human being from every point of view is required to take our hand upon this way, which is full of twists and turns and prevent the rebellion of our instincts, to have virtuous principles and his deeds and words set upon our hearts and very beings, nurture, courage, bravery, friendship and other human beings, brotherhood, forgiveness, loyalty, correctness, trustworthiness, and purity within our spirits. What person other than a pure and immaculate prophet could be chosen to such a teacher and guide? For this very reason, it is not possible that God not show his mercy to us and prevent us from the existence of such leaders and teachers. A. Discussion on this will continue in the next lesson. Think and answer. Number one, do you feel that with whatever knowledge you gain, what you do not know has increased? Give examples. Number two, can you clarify the difference between the blind imitation and being followers of the prophets? Number three, if without a guide we take the unknown road, what dangers will exist for us? Number four, Describe the dimension of our need for leadership of the prophets. Number five, can you guess what other discussion remains in this area to complete this discussion? Lesson 22, the need of having prophets who present the law. In the previous lesson, we came to know the need for the existence of the prophets from the two dimensions of learning and training. Now we have reached the point where we need to know the social laws and the important role of the prophets in this area. We know that the greatest privileges of life for the human being, which is the factor for all of the progress in all of the various areas of life, is a dynamic social encounter. 
Most certainly, if human beings lived apart from each other, they would still be like the human beings in the Stone Age from the point of view of knowledge and civilization. Yes, it is the united efforts and endeavors which light the lamp of culture and civilization. It is united efforts and endeavors which are the source and origin for all of these scientific discoveries. As an example, if we consider the journey to the moon, we see that this was not the result of the work of one or several scientists. Rather, it has been the result of the efforts of millions of scholars or thousands of years and the experience of scholars gained through group living, and then this knowledge reached the point where we find it today. If a skilled physician in our age succeeds to transplant the living heart of a human being from the body of a dead person into the body of another person and save him from certain death, this has been made possible from the result of the experiences of thousands of physicians and surgeons throughout history, which, by means of teachers, has been transferred to their students. But of course, social life, on the other hand, does, does present difficulties in the conflicts which arise between the rights and interests of human beings which each other, resulting sometimes in aggression and even war. It is here that the need exists for law, programming and clear rules. Law can solve three great problems for us. Number one, law defines the duties of each individual in relation to society. Social duties are clarified and talents are coordinated which blossom among human beings. Number two, law coordinate the methods to be used to carry out one's responsibility by every individual. Number three, law prevent the aggression of individuals against the rights of each other. They prevent chaos and conflicts between individuals and groups and when necessary punishments are provided for aggressors. Who is the best lawgiver? Now, we have to see what person is best to bring laws which meet the human being's needs in such a way that all three principles mentioned above are followed and included as well as clarifying the limits, duties and rights of the individual and society so that the best system be put to use and aggression be prevented. Let us to give a simple example here. Human society can be compared to a great train and the leaders or rulers to a locomotive which causes the human society to move towards a destination. The laws are like the rails or tracks which provide the line to be followed by this train to a clear destination. A line which moves throughout twists and turns, it is clear that a good train must have the following conditions. The land which the train moves through must have sufficient strength for the greatest extent of pressure. The distance between the two tracks of or rails must be carefully coordinated with the wheels of the locomotive as well as the walls of tunnels and heights of the tunnels must suit the highest level of trains. The ups and downs must not be so sharp that they are beyond the power of the brakes of the train. The possibility of landslides or floods along the way which the train moves must be carefully studied so that the train can pass through that area under all conditions. Noting these examples, we return to human society. A lawgiver who wants to give the best laws for human beings must have the following qualities. Number 1. Know the human species in a perfect and total way and be aware of all of their instincts, feelings, needs, and difficulties. Number two, all of the praiseworthy qualities and talents which exist in a human being should be taken into consideration and laws should be made use for their blossoming. Number three, the events and accidents which are possible to occur should be foreseen as well as the necessary precaution taken. Number four, such a lawgiver should have no particular interests in society so that in providing the laws, his thoughts turn upon his own interests or his family or his social group. Number five, the lawgiver must allow human beings the possibility to benefit from all of the advances made as well as to learn from the deviations. Number six, this lawgiver must at the maximum be free from error, mistakes and forgetfulness. Number seven, Finally, the lawgiver must have such power that no position or power in society may intimidate him, and he not fears anyone. At the same time, he must be very kind and merciful. In what person have these conditions been gathered? Can a human being be the best lawgiver? 
Has anyone understood the human being in a complete way to date? A famous scholar in our age has written a book about the human being calling it Man and the Unknown Creature. Have the human spirit, instincts, and feelings been completely known? Are the physical, spiritual, and emotional needs of the human being clear for a person? Can someone be found in the midst of average people who have no special benefits or interests in society? Do you know of any human being among ordinary people who is free from error and sin and who has the awareness of all of the issues of life and individual human being and society? Thus, other than God and those who receive the divine revelation, there can never be a good and perfect lawgiver. In this way, we must conclude that God who created the human being to reach perfection must send someone as a guide to place the laws of heaven at the disposal of a human being. It is clear that at a time when people know that laws are the laws of God, they will put them into practice with more credibility and certainty. In other words, this awareness is a valuable guarantee of those laws. The relationship between monotheism and prophethood. It is important to note the following that the system of creation is itself a living witness for the existence of divine prophets and their missions. The reason is this. A short glance at this wondrous system of existence shows us that nothing of the needs of creatures is hidden from his mercy. For instance, if he gives us eyes with which to see, he has also given these eyes lids and lashes so that they are protected and so that the light which enters is regulated and the eye is not harmed. The eye has a radius which can see in several directions without the turning of the head. Is it possible that God, who so met the needs of human being, not provide a leader and a guide who is pure and trustworthy to bring his revelation? A famous philosopher, Abu Ali Sina, Avicina, in his famous book Shifa says, The needs of the human beings for the sending of the prophets for the survival of the human species are their moving towards perfection is greater than their need for lashes, eyebrows, and the arc of the foot. Thus, is it possible for him to provide those and not these? Think and answer. Number one, what are the greatest needs of life of humanity? Number two, why is it that a human being cannot live without laws? Number three. Give a living example to clarify the role of law in human life. Number four. What qualities should the best lawgiver have? Number five. Why should the prophets be of the human species? Lesson 23. Why are the prophets free of sin and error? Without doubt, more important than anything else, a prophet must attract the trust of the general public in such a way that his words contain no possibility of being lies or erroneous, otherwise his position of leadership will be a shaky one. If they are not immaculate using the excuse that the prophets have erred, people who seek the truth from what they say will begin to doubt their invitation. It will not be accepted, or at least their words will not be accepted with all of their hearts. This reason, which can be called trustworthiness, is one of the most important reasons for their being immaculate. In other words, how is it possible that God give his commands for his people to follow a person who is not truthful? For if this person were to err or sin, people would not follow him. If they do, they have erred, and if they do not, they have weakened his position of leadership. In particular, since the position of the leadership of the prophets completely differs with the leadership of others, for people receive their entire program of life from the prophets. Because of this, we see that the great commentators speak about the worse. Obey God and obey the prophet and those charged with authority among you. Saying that the command for absolute obedience is because the prophet is immaculate as well as being charged with authority. The pure leaders like the holy prophet are referred to as being charged with authority. If not, God would never give the command to unconditional obedience to them. Another way of proving the immaculateness of the Holy Prophet in relation to any sin 
is that any factor of sin is condemned to defeat within the very being of the Holy Prophet. The explanation of this is, when we turn to ourselves, we see that we too are immaculate in relation to some sins or evil or unacceptable deeds. Note the following examples. Can you find an intelligent person who thinks about eating fire or trash or filth? Can you find an intelligent person who will walk naked through the streets and bazaars? Clearly not. If we saw such deeds from someone, we will be assured of the fact that he is no longer normal and has become insane because an intelligent person would never do these things. When we analyze such behavior, we see that the ugliness of such deeds is so clear that an intelligent person would never even consider them. It is here that we can imagine what this short phrase means and say that every intelligent and healthy person is free of unacceptable deeds. From this stage, we take a step further. We see some people who are free from unacceptable deeds. For instance, an aware physician, an expert, who knows the various kinds of microbes well is never prepared to drink the polluted water of the dirty clothes of a person who has one of the most dangerous contagious diseases, whereas an illiterate person perhaps would be indifferent to such a thing. With another simple example, we reach a point that However much the level of a person rises in the area of awareness, they are less likely to do evil or ugly deeds. Taking into consideration that if a person's faith in awareness were to rise and have so much faith in God and his court of justice so that everything that he sees is present before his eyes, such a person will be free of all sin and every ugly deed in relation to him, like walking naked through the street, will be in our eyes only. For such a person, the property of something forbidden is just like the flames of fire. And just like we do not put fire in our mouths, he does not put something which is forbidden into his mouth. We can then conclude that the prophets, because of the extraordinary knowledge, awareness, and faith which they have tamed the motives of sin, and the most exciting factors causing sin will not prevail upon his intellect and faith. This is why we say that the prophets are immaculate, they are insured against sin. How can the station of purity be an honor? Some people who do not understand the meaning of purity and the factors of immaculateness and being free from sin are not aware of the fact that if God prevents one from sin and destroys the factors which causes sin, this will not be an honor for that person. This is coercive purity and therefore is not considered to be a virtue. But with the discussion which he had above, this issue is very clear. The freedom of the prophets from sin in no sense is a coercive one. Rather, it is born from their strong faith and absolute certainty, their awareness and extraordinary knowledge and this is the greatest honor for them. If an aware physician takes care of and treats a person with the worst of diseases, is this a sign of his being forced to do so? If such a person were to follow the rules of health, would this be considered to be a virtue? If a person, a lawyer, were to take the disgraceful considerations into effect of a dreadful crime and try to prevent it, is this a virtue? Thus, we reach this conclusion that the fact that the prophets are free from sin is both one of their own choice and great honor for them. Think and answer. Number one, how many branches are there to being immaculate? Number two, if prophets were not free from sin, what would happen? Number three, what is the truth of the situation of immaculateness? Number four, other than the examples given here, can you point out another example of someone who is immaculate in relation to another group? Number five, is the immaculateness of the prophets coercive or a result of free will? Why? Lesson 24. The best way to come to know the prophets. Without doubt, accepting the claims of every pretender to prophethood is unintelligent and illogical. It was possible that the claims to prophethood and the mission on behalf of God were true, but the possibility also existed that an opportunist and a cheat was introducing himself as a prophet. Because of this, 
It is necessary that a certain criteria be established for evaluating the claims of the prophets and their relationship with God. In order to reach such a determination, various ways exist, the most important of which are the two. Number one, to study the content of the invitation of the prophets and to collect the laws and signs. Number two, miracles and deeds which exceed normal human ones. Let us be allowed to first speak about miracles. There are some people who are surprised by the word miracle or consider miracles to be equivalent to fairy tales and myths. Whereas, if we look carefully at the meaning of the word miracle, we would not get such an incorrect picture of it. A miracle is not an act which is not possible and without reason or cause. Rather, a miracle is something as simple as an interpretation of an extraordinary deed, the performance of which is beyond the means of normal people and can only be undertaken with the help of something beyond nature. Thus, a miracle has the following conditions. Number one, something which is possible and accepted. Number two, normal people and even geniuses by replying on the strong power of humanity cannot do the deed. Number three, the miracle maker must be so certain of what he is doing that he can challenge others to try. Number four, no one else was able to offer these miracles and everyone was impotent before them. Miracles must be connected with the claims of prophethood or imamate. Thus, any work which are extraordinary and comes from someone other than a prophet or pure imam is not called a miracle, but a blessing. Several clear examples. Many people are familiar with the miracles of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, who was able to raise the dead to life and heal the incurably sick. Is there any clear and intelligent reason why a human being after death is not able to return to life? Is there any scientific or intelligent reason why a person with an incurable disease cannot be cured? Doubtlessly, however, the power which a human being has under the present conditions is not sufficient to be able to raise the dead and give them life or to treat some diseases even if all the doctors of the world were to work together and give each other of their experience and knowledge. But what is to prevent a person with a divine power and with particular awareness which has come from God's endless ocean of knowledge to be able to give life to the body of a dead person or to cure one who has an incurable disease? Science says, I do not know and I do not have the ability, but it would never say it is impossible or unintelligent. And other examples, it is not possible for any human being to journey to the moon without making use of a spaceship. But at the same time that there is nothing to prevent a superior force and a horse which is stronger than horses, which we know to be placed at the disposal of a person and without using a spaceship, that person go to the moon or planets above it. If a person can do such an extraordinary feat and along with that claim prophethood and ask others to try and challenge everyone and everyone prove to be important in relation to him, we will find certainty that it is from God because it is not possible that God gives such a strength to a human being who lies and would cause his creation to be misled. Note this with care. Miracles should not be confused with superstitions. Extremism of the right or the left has always been the source of corruption and darkening of the truth. As to miracles, this very statement is true. Whereas some pseudo-intellectuals speedily and directly deny miracles, another group tries to extend miracles and take the weak traditions and fairy tale superstitions which were most often done with the help of the enemies and mix them with miracles and the scientific visage of miracles of the prophets and cover them with fairy tales like stories and unclarities so that the real miracles of these kind of stories not be known. It is because of this that our great scholars were always very careful to avoid such mistakes in Islamic traditions relating to miracles. Also, it is because of this that the science of biography came into being so that the methods of traditions be known and that the correct and the weak traditions be separated from one another and that the useless not mix with the truth. The policies of the colonialists and the extremists today have been busy trying to mix the pure with the impure 
and in this way give an unscientific image to all of them. We must be very aware of these conspiracies of the enemies. What is the difference between miracles and extraordinary deeds? We have often heard that a group of ascetics have undertaken extraordinary feats. People who have seen these deeds are not few. This is a reality, not a fairy tale. It is here that this question arises as to what difference is there between this extraordinary work and the miracles of the prophets, and what criteria should we use to separate them? Here, the question arises as to what the difference is between these extraordinary feats and the miracle of the prophets and what criteria we use to distinguish them. This question has several responses, the two clearest of which are 1. An ascetic always does work, which is limited, in other words, no ascetic is ready to do what you ask him to do. He undertakes an extraordinary feat which he himself wants to do. That is something which he has practiced a great deal, learned how to do well, and at which is an expert. The reason for this is clear, because the power or force of every human being is limited, and in one or several things only can he attain skill. But the extraordinary deeds of the prophets had no limits, no conditions to be able to perform them. They can, whenever they want, perform a miracle which is suggested to them, because they receive help from the endless power of the Creator, and we know that God's power is not limited, whereas the power of the human being is very limited. 2. The work done by an ascetic, another ascetic, does the same thing in the same way, that is, it is not beyond the power of the human being because of this. An ascetic who does extraordinary feats never invites others to try and to do what he has done and he does not challenge him because he knows that in his town or in the surrounding areas there are other individuals such as himself who can do the same thing. But the prophets with complete assurance and certainty challenge others and they say even if you were to bring together all of humanity they could not do what we are doing or can do. This difference is also true in relation to magic. These refer to the two differences which, have, which we have mentioned, and they divide a miracle from magic. Note this with care. Think and answer. Number one, why do we call a miracle a miracle? Number two, is a miracle an exception to the law of causes? Number three, how many differences can you name between the work of the prophets and that of the ascetic and magician? Number four, what is the main condition for a miracle? Number five, have you ever seen something which is similar to a miracle? Lesson 25, the greatest miracle of the Prophet of Islam. All scholars of Islam believe that the Quran is the greatest miracle of the Prophet of Islam. When we say the most superior, it is because in the first place, the Quran is not an intellectual miracle, but rather has to do with the spirit and intellect of the people, and secondly, it is eternal and everlasting, and third, it is a miracle which has cried out for 14 centuries. It says, If you do not believe that this is the book of God, bring one like it. This invitation to an equivalent or something like it or challenge has appeared several times in the Holy Quran, in one place it says, Say, if the whole of humanity and jinn were to gather together to produce the life of this Quran, they could not produce the like thereof, even if they backed up each other with help and support. In another place, it has made the condition for the bringing of something like it even easier. It says, Bring ten surahs forged like unto it and call to your aid whomever you can, other than God, if you speak the truth. If they, your false gods, answer not your call, know that this revelation is sent down replete with the knowledge of God. And if you are in doubt about which we have revealed to our servants, then bring a surah like it and call your witnesses other than God if you are truthful. And the next verse, it directly states, 
But if you do not, and you shall never do, guard yourselves against fire. These continuous and successive invitations to challenge the Quran shows that the Holy Prophet placed the greatest of emphasis and importance and importance upon the miracle of the Quran, even though many other miracles have been recorded about the Prophet and have appeared in books on Islamic history. As the Holy Quran is a living miracle, we will, in this discussion, give greater emphasis to it. How they have remained impotent in face of this challenge, it is interesting that the Holy Quran places the greatest emphasis upon inviting the opponents to the arena and with stimulating comparisons, it challenges them to enter the arena so that no excuse remain for anyone. Words like, if you speak the truth, you can never do so, even if you seek help from all of humanity. Bring at least one worse like it. If you become a kafir, a flaming fire is awaiting you. Speak of this truth. These are all on one side. On the other side, the struggle of the Holy Prophet with the opponents was not a simple struggle because Islam not only endangered their religion, which they firmly supported, but also endangered their economic, political interests and even their very existence. In other words, the progress and influence of Islam caused all of the lives to be turned upside down. Thus, they were obliged to come to the arena with all of their power and force, no matter what the cost, in order to disarm the Holy Prophet, they would have to bring a verse, like a verse of the Holy Quran, so that they could no longer rely on the Quran as a miracle, and everyone who believed in it would become defective, and it would become a document for proving their truth. They invited all of the Arabs who were learned scholars to help them, but every time that they tried to challenge the Holy Quran, they were defeated, and they were readily retreated. The story of Walid ibn Mughayra. Among the people invited to this challenge was Walid bin ibn Mughayra from the Bani Makhzum, who was famous at the time among the Arabs for his literary abilities. They asked him to think about this challenge and to give his opinion about the miraculous verses of the Quran and its extraordinary influence. Walid asked the Holy Prophet to recite a verse of the Holy Quran for him. The Holy Prophet recited a verse from Surah Hamim, a sajda. This verse caused such excitement in Walid that he, without thinking, arose from his place and left the group of the Bani Makhzum, which had been formed, saying, I swear that I have heard words from Muhammad, peace be upon him, which neither resemble the words of human beings nor the fairies. His words have a special tone and a particular beauty. They are like a branch of tree, which bears a great deal of fruit. They are words which are victorious over all things, and nothing will be victorious over them. These words cause the Quraysh to whisper among themselves, Walid has lost his heart to Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abu Jahl in a state of anxiety, went to his home and told him what the Quraysh were saying. He invited him to a meeting of theirs. Walid went to their group and said, Do you think Muhammad, peace be upon him, is crazy? Have you seen the effects of insanity in him? Those who were present said, No. Do you think that he is a liar? Was he not famous to date among you for his truthfulness and his trustworthiness? Do you not call him a truthful and trustworthy person? Some of the leaders of the Quraysh said, Then, what should we call him? What should we relate him to? Walid thought a bit and then said, He is a magician. Even though they tried to turn the common people away from the Quran, which they were attracted to, this commentary of magic was itself living proof of the extraordinary attraction of the Holy Quran, and they called this attraction bewitchment, while it had nothing to do with magic. It was because of this that the Quraysh spread this opinion everywhere that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a magician and these verses are his magic. Keep away from him and try not to listen to what he says. 
but in spite of all of their efforts and endeavors, their plan had no effect. The thirsty were everywhere and plentiful. They had pure hearts, and group by group they joined the Quran. They drank from the pure water of the heavenly message, and the enemy defeated, retreated. The Holy Quran today challenges all of the people of the world and invites them to struggle against it. It cries out, If you doubt the truth of these verses, and you think that it is born of human thought, bring its like. O scholars, philosophers, and literary persons, writers from whatever nation or people. We also know that the enemies of Islam, in particular Christian priests, who know Islam to be a revolutionary school full of meaning, a strong competitor, and a danger to it, every year spend millions of dollars to spread anti-Islamic propaganda. They are active in Islamic countries under the cover of culture, science, and health. What would happen if they made the way closer, if they were to invite Arab Christian scholars, poets, writers, and philosophers to write verses like the verses of the Holy Quran to silence the Muslims? It is clear that if such a thing were possible, at whatever the cost, they would do so. The very fact that they were unable to do so is a proof before the opponents and proof of the miracle of the Quran. Think and answer. Number one, why is the Holy Quran the highest and the most superior of the miracles of the Holy Prophet? Number two, how does the Quran challenge people? Number three, why have the enemies of the Quran referred to it as magic? Number four, why is Islam a strong opponent for present day? What was the story of Walid ibn Mughayrah?